watched nine parts a year in a life of an Indian village. Congratulations, Lexi. Lexi was a recent um, PhD student in the Department of Anthropology. She won the 2019 Bailey Prize awarded by the Royal Asiatic Society for an outstanding thesis on an Asian topic completed at a British university. Nine Paths is based on the PhD fieldwork Lexi did for this thesis, um, but it's almost a complete rewriting of that thesis. It's a beautifully written narrative, nonfiction, accessible to a general reader. I strongly recommend it to you all. What's quite remarkable about Nine Paths is that it's uh, uh, a very intimate portrait um, of Muslim women and their families in India today particularly important and revealing in a time when Muslims in India are perhaps some of the most persecuted minorities in the world in the context of rising Hindu majoritarianism in India. I'm really, really pleased to also have with us two people who I feel could not be more appropriate to discuss Lexi's book uh, and throw some light on, on it uh, in bearing in mind their own remarkable bodies of work. The first is um, Sonia Falero, a journalist and writer, a Royal Literary Fellow at Goldsmiths, who in many ways works very much like an anthropologist in the research she does for her books. Her last book is the highly acclaimed The Good Girls and Ordinary Killing, about the death of two girls in a village in Uttar Pradesh. We were privileged to be able to discuss um, good girl, the good girls with Sonia last year when it was published um, here at the LSE. This is a book um, which, yeah, is incredibly written, a window onto, yeah, uh, what it means to grow up uh, as a, as a low, lower caste girl, um, lower caste woman in, in India, um, but um, deals with so many themes. Um, I strongly recommend it to you too. A book which has recently been long listed for several prizes and has been on several best book lists, including the New York Times Editor's Choice Review. Um, we also have with us Trisha Jeffrey, an anthropologist and sociologist and emeritus professor at the University of Edinburgh. Trisha has conducted um, about four decades of research in a Muslim village in Uttar Pradesh, Pradesh, written many books and articles on Muslim women. Uh, I'd like to draw attention to two um, fantastic books here, Frogs in a Well and Don't Marry Me to a Plowman. Patricia Jeffrey is um, in the final throes of a manuscript on the transitions of ordinary life in a Muslim village in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, charting, you know, her uh, looking back over over the last 40 years. So what I'm going to do is um, hand over first to Lexi to tell us a bit about her book uh, and also to read us a short extract uh, before I invite Sonia and Trisha for their comments and thoughts. Um, we'll let the conversation between Lexi, Sonia and Trisha run up to at about two o'clock before opening up um, for Q&A for the last uh, half an hour. And I'll invite you in the audience to pose your questions then. So thanks very much and uh, welcome everybody. And over to you, Lexi. Thank you, Alpa. And before I begin, I just want to start by thanking Alpa for putting this event together and also to thank Patricia and Sonia for so kindly agreeing to be part of this discussion. Um, having read and admired all of your work, particularly the ways in which you write ethnographically about India and about women, I feel extremely honoured to be speaking alongside all of you. Uh, so Nine Paths is a book about nine women. They span three generations. The youngest, Rani, is approaching her 15th birthday when the book begins and her grandmother, Mariam, does not know how old she is, though she does remember being a small girl at the time of independence. And she was asked to choose her birthday when she first registered for a voter ID card many decades later in an act that is totally commonplace in rural India. The book is based on 16 months that I spent in a West Bengal village undertaking ethnographic fieldwork for my PhD in social anthropology here at the LSE. But as Alba has said, it is written very deliberately in a non-academic uh, narrative, non-fiction style. And this is something that I will come back to in a little bit. 
But first, by telling you about these nine women and their lives, I want to start offering some ideas about the question central to this event, namely, what is it like to be a minority woman in India today? So the women in this book live on an island at the edge of what are called the Sundarbans, which is a conjunction of the Bengali words for beautiful Sundar and forest bans, which is a 10,000 square kilometer mangrove forest that straddles the border of India and Bangladesh. It is a really extraordinary landscape. And it's one that has been written about so evocatively uh, in the ethnography of Anu Jale and Meghna Mehta and the fiction of Amitav Ghosh as a shifting riverine place of small islands and hungry tides. But these islands and their occupants are on the front lines of climate change. And they have been ravaged repeatedly by cyclones in recent years, had their crops decimated, their homes destroyed and their means of making an income wiped out. For these women's village on one of the better protected islands, they face a steady stream of new arrivals, escaping desperate conditions further south, overcrowding the limited space and exhausting already scant resources. Like so many across India, they are caught in the pincer grip of a persistent absence of infrastructural development and the escalating challenges of ecological destruction that is making the land around them almost uninhabitable. And this dual challenge is the first thing that I want to highlight about being a minority woman in India at present, which is that they're often those for whom the brutal consequences of environmental degradation and the state's inability to address them are not some scary possible future, but the present reality. The second factor that I want to draw attention to is interrelated, and it is the restriction of endemic inequality. Like an estimated 65 to 70 percent of Indians, these women belong to a rural community far from the thrusting skyscrapers and golden opportunities of the megacities. Bar one exception, they live in kada houses, those made from earth and dung. There is no running water in the village and electricity arrived shortly before I did and is absent for at least half of the time. These things are by no means unusual but chronicling what daily lives are like lived under these conditions, particularly by women, serves to ground loftier ideas such as aspiration or everyday ethics in an often harsh existence. Hardship begins for these women from the moment that they're born, often at home, to mothers who frequently suffer from malnutrition and to families whose resources are already very tightly stretched. It continues to schooling where they will have no money for the transport there or for the extra tuition necessary in order to succeed. And from where they will frequently be absent due to illness or because they're needed at home to look after other children or help with domestic labor. By age 10, many girls are working, helping their mothers with the dada kaj or embroidery work that has become ubiquitous in the village in the last decade. Though championed by local microfinance groups as a solution for women's employment by allowing them to work from home, it in fact represents an abysmally remunerated and physically punishing form of labor that these women have no extra time to undertake, but are given no choice but to. By puberty, many have left school entirely, working at home and awaiting imminent marriage, after which they will soon be expected to have children of their own and assume all of the domestic labor responsibilities of their new household. If I asked any of these nine women what a woman's daily life was like, what the greatest difficulty was, what they spent most of their time doing, they would all answer with a single word, kaj or work. This might seem like a superficial point, but it is worth recognizing and drawing attention to the fact that these women largely define themselves by work, work that is never ending, never acknowledged and never remunerated, even though they do not belong to the formalized economy. It serves as a worthy reminder that any economic analysis of India or any country for that matter is remiss if it does not explore and consider the impact of the informal labor world of domestic work, child rearing and other forms of unpaid care that underpin and facilitate the entire system. The third thing I want to highlight about these women is that they are Muslim and thus members of India's largest and most persecuted religious minority. Whilst their faith provides for them a huge source of strength and sense of purpose, it has also come to signify a terrifying obstacle to inclusion, justice and security. All of these women, and in fact everyone in the village, was petrified of statelessness. 
specifically accusations that they were illegal Muslim immigrants and should be deported to Bangladesh. These fears seem in hindsight horrifyingly prescient, as in the last few years we have witnessed the stripping of around 2 million people, mostly Muslim, of their Indian citizenship, who are now facing deportation from the neighbouring state of Assam. The women were anxious about communal violence, about it affecting both them, but more significantly about the male members of their households, as it did in the case of one of the women whilst I was there. They struggle to envisage a future in a country in which there exists a government rhetoric repeatedly amplified by the media that their religious identity is in conflict with their national one. When I began my fieldwork in 2015, it was the start of the lynchings of Muslims, Dalits, Adivasis and others accused of illegally slaughtering cattle or eating beef. Seven years on, things have only intensified, particularly since the BJP's re-election in 2019. Since then, we have seen the stripping of special status for Kashmir, the 2020 riots in Delhi, the outlawing in many states of interreligious marriage, and in recent months, the boycotting of Muslim businesses and demolition of Muslim homes, shops, and places of worship. For Muslim women in India, an already very marginalized group, the bans on hijabs in colleges in Karnataka, the persecution of female Muslim journalists such as Rana Ayub, and the placing of prominent and outspoken Muslim women on fake auction sites at the start of this year further creates a climate of fear and intimidation. The fourth thing that is very apparent in these women's lives, like lives of so many women around the world, is that they are violent. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that often this violence is directed at them by members of their own community, and typically it's their own families. Physical violence against women is startlingly prevalent and it is often at the hands of husbands, sons, brothers, fathers, and fathers-in-law, or other male relatives. Female relatives, particularly mothers-in-law, may also be violent, and the physical abuse was something that all of the nine women had been touched by. Beyond this, they experienced violence of more ephemeral kinds, that of oppressive social and patriarchal norms, damaging rhetoric from within their religion and as a result of it, and the kinds of structural violence resulting from inequality, poverty, and absence of development and the environmental challenges that I've already touched upon. The final thing I want to highlight about these nine women and their lives is that they are so much more than a series of depressing pronouncements about the state of modern India. Of course, these things are part of their story, but by focusing on their intimate lives, their navigation of daily dramas and household tensions, their loves and heartbreaks and their dreams for both themselves and for their children, they come alive as the beautiful, fascinating and complicated people that they are. In Nine Paths, you will learn that Rani is a talented 400 meter runner who harbors secret dreams of becoming a police officer. You will learn that Noura is a born storyteller who has a tale, whether real or imaginary, for absolutely every occasion. Much like with your children, I don't think you're supposed to have a favorite character in a book that you're writing or a favorite informant, but Aaliyah was and certainly is mine. In this book, you will learn that she named all of her sons after the Pakistani cricket team, is by far the best gardener in the village and has endured a life of incredible misfortune with an unfathomable amount of dignity. This pertains to something I touched upon fleetingly at the beginning. Often in writing, anthropologists shy away from what is at the heart of our discipline, which is real people's life stories. With Nine Paths, I wanted to move beyond the cutouts of interlocutors that sometimes appear in order to illustrate a particular theoretical point and instead convey that rich human experience can tell us all of these macro things that we might want to know, just in a different, more grounded and hopefully more accessible way. And this is approach reflected in the work of everyone on this panel. So in nine paths, you will begin at the height of summer when a spate of accidents have begun to happen, affecting all of the nine women and the five families they belong to in some way. You follow them as their stories intersect and overlap, as they navigate marriage, death, family dramas, extramarital affairs, rumor, kidnap, politics, spirit possession, gossip, the future, dreams, and even the afterlife. Yes, village life is truly like a soap opera. In doing so, I hope that you gain a picture of what life is like for nine very different ordinary women whose circumstances embody the intersection of being marginal or a minority in many significant ways.
and having uh, Profess Leah to be my favourite of <laughs> my uh, informants characters, I am just going to read a short uh, passage from the start of the book, which introduces her. Um, and it's a time uh, when, as I said, a number of accidents have been happening in the village and uh, it's an incredibly hot summer and people are getting uh, hot and frustrated. Up the mud path that ran behind Nura's home, Aaliyah too was often awake in those shadowy hours. Her troubles had begun long before the latest spate of accidents, accumulating imperceptibly like the grey mud and silt slapped onto the banks at the edges of the island, building up in incremental drifts until they almost overwhelmed her. Her days were always long now, any appetite for sleep suppressed by the gnaw of worries that knotted in her stomach. Exhaustion had long ago consumed her, carving deep sable coloured moons under her eyes and dulling the aching muscles of a body that so rarely found stillness. Her mind was keen, however, even as her limbs slowed into the repetitive movements of the menial embroidery work that she accepted with the resigned dignity of someone who knows both that they have no other choice and that they deserve better. The work is not difficult, she would say, whenever anyone expressed sympathy for her ceaseless undertakings. It is boring. Her dogged labor was hardest at this time of year, when even at night the heat failed to retreat. Although the earthen walls of Lekacha houses such as Aaliyah's were designed to breathe, the tin or bamboo roofs packed with straw trapped the sultry air. Even outside on the veranda, Aaliyah could feel the sweat begin to creep across her neck as she sat hunched over, her eyes aching with the strain of looping tiny iridescent beads onto shimmering threads. There was a kind of peace to the night, the landscape softening around her, the stars littering the sky. Aaliyah was one of the only women who had learned, for the most part at least, not to fear the dark. On an evening uncomfortable even for summer, a few weeks after the storm, there was another job that demanded her attention. The proud cultivator of one of the most impressive gardens in the village, Aaliyah had a clutch of mango trees and pragmatically divided her fruits three ways, those to sell to others, those to be eaten raw and teeth suckingly sour as she preferred them, and those to be allowed to ripen before being gathered in the soft sling of a worn out sari and taken to the outhouse kitchen where a large and battered pot awaited them. Sitting on the earthen floor, Aaliyah peeled and sliced the mangoes. A faint glow troubled the gloom of the kitchen, silhouetting her fingers as she coaxed the soft fruit from its leathery, flaccid skins, scooping it into her cut palms. She was careful to add each splash of juice to the hissing pan, into which she dropped handfuls of sugar, salt, chili powder, and intuitive mixes of whole and ground spices. She sat as the hours drifted past, only her arm moving over the slow burbling cauldron, making sure that the syrupy mixture did not catch on the scratched and scoured bottom. Behind her on the cot bed, her husband Kabir stirred. They had slept apart for so many years, he alone in the outhouse, she in the main house along with the rest of the family. Aaliyah paused, listening, waiting. His labored breathing resumed slowly, subsiding into soft snores. Her shoulders unclenched and she allowed her arm to move once again in rhythmic circles. Her thoughts trailed away to other things beyond the kitchen walls, to the boundless sky beyond. She had been watching these nights as the silver moon fattened, its heaviness drawing it low in the sky so that it sat almost atop the trees. She would watch in the coming days as it would begin to diminish, carved to a dwindling angular crescent before it would vanish momentarily the faintest curve then reappearing to begin the cycle once again. When the cycle had been completed once more, the month of Ramzan would commence. Beautiful, thank you, Lexi. Thank um, you. I have quite a few questions to ask you, but maybe I'll, I'll kind of save them for a little bit later and, and I'll just hand over straight away to Sonia for her thoughts and reflections. So Sonia, I, over I just, to you. Yeah, I, I just want to start by saying, Lexi, um, I loved your book. Um, I think it is, it's really beautifully written. And I think it's so, so clever because, um, you know, it makes, 
it, it tells us in great detail about the economic, social, political, and cultural challenges uh, that women on this island in the Sundarbans face. Uh, and yet it does it with such a delicate touch uh, that what you are consuming this you know, enormous amount of information and perhaps not realizing it because of the beauty of your language, because of your pacing, because of how you're able to, you know, uh, build this narrative without burdening uh, the story down with with information. So I think that's a remarkable skill uh, that um, narrative nonfiction journalists like me um, uh, always take note of. So congratulations and congratulations you. on your book. Uh, I actually worked in the Sundarbans for five years. I was um, on an island called uh, Gosaba. And so, you know, reading all this, uh, it just, it was just a reminder of all of those years of experience of going back and forth. And um, there were actually two things that I wanted to talk to you about. The first one, um, here, it's, it, it struck me uh, that this is one of the threads that is running through your book. And I underline this on page 82. It says, for those who had next to nothing, a reputation might be their most valuable possession. Um, and that's so, so very true for women living in, in the community that you talk about. But it's also true for women in most parts of India, including in Uttar Pradesh, where my own book, The Good Girls, is set. And I think that people who haven't, uh, who aren't a part of these communities or who don't work there um, may not realize the extent to which honor it is, it applies to everything. It is constant, you know, it is that constant burden that is placed on the shoulders of, uh, of an infant uh, and she carries it to her grave. Uh, number three, that it can and, and often does uh, lead to violence and can also lead to death. So in, in the case of the good girls, for example, um, you know, which is about two children in a village in Uttar Pradesh who were found hanging in a mango tree. Um, honor played a very big role in how, in, how in, in of course their death, but also in how they were allowed to live their life, you know, um, while reporting the story, I re realized, I kept thinking, oh, they were, they were just kids. They were just 14, a 14 year old and a 16 year old who wanted to be kids. They wanted to go to school. They wanted to gossip. They wanted to use their mobile phones. They wanted to talk to boys. And what we don't realize um, when we talk about honor is that honor makes life on an everyday basis uh, just very difficult and very unhappy. Um, and I wondered if you could talk some more about the burden of honor affecting the ambitions, the hopes and the dreams and just, and, and the everyday joy of the women in your book. Um, yeah, I mean, I think having read The Good Girls um, and it's such, I think you so clearly convey that oppressive presence of honor in every facet of life mm. but also the fact that often honor is something that it is not it's not even in really in your ability to control that yeah. you might you might lose control of your reputation through no fault of your own yeah. um, just because someone decides that you've uh, you, even if you just you know attract the unwanted attention of someone that is enough of a cause for dishonor, even though you haven't actually behaved in any, any way. So it was certainly, it was something that was um, stifling and totally overwhelming, I think, for girls in the village. Mm. In one of the families that I um, the book is about, there is a character who is not one of the nine women that I kind of focus in on, but she's the sister and the daughter and the granddaughter of these nine uh, of this particular family and she uh, had basically dishonored her family by doing things that teenage girls do having a mobile phone you know texting a boy um 
sort of being seen out with a boy. She then got herself into this awful situation, which is quite common, where she was approached by um, some young men who sort of intimated that, you know, they wanted to be her friend and she was ultimately kidnapped and taken um, to Bihar. Um, and I think that it's not only so incredibly stifling for the girls involved, but it's their families as well. And her parents just became, their lives became consumed with trying to mitigate the impact that her dishonoring had on their family. Um, and that her mother was sort of subject to all kinds of awful rumors as well. And a large sort of part of their narrative in the book is as a sort of desperate crawling back to try and reclaim some status um, in the village. Um, and I mean, in terms of aspiration, you know, one thing that I was really conscious of when talking, you know, trying to convey in the opening comments that I made about what it's like being a, a minority woman is that from such an early age your aspirations are curtailed and partly that is due to inequality and partly that's due to poverty but that's also to do with this immense burden of a, a, a patriarchal system and the inability to imagine yourself having a life beyond marriage, beyond motherhood, beyond a family, but even really an inability to imagine yourself having a life where you go to college because how are you going to get there and you're going to be unaccompanied and what are you going to get up to and what are people going to say if you're 18 or 19 and you're not married? Um, so I think it is truly something that begins you know, as you said, from birth, and it's just this ever-present kind of oppressive force. Can I interject quickly there just to ask a question <laughs> on the back of your question, um, Sonia, you know, I'll, 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 uh, it's really the burden of honour is, is, is obviously something that's so omnipresent in, in, in the book and in both of your books and in, in your book, Sonia, it leads to the death, you know, I mean, it's one of the things that leads to the death of these girls. But I was wondering, Lexi, whether you feel it's um it's changed over time because one of the things that's kind of you know your book is so subtle and that's you know one of its beauties and what there is the rise you feel of formalized um religion uh islam uh the tabliki jamaat you know is kind of there in the backdrop right you've got this mosque mm -hmm. and um you know it's there like you can feel its presence but presumably this wasn't so some years back and and do you think that this whole burden of honor that son is asking you about has changed over time has it become more of a burden um for these women has what's kind of intergenerational transformations in in uh do you think uh the women in these villages have seen i mean i think it's um one of the challenges of field work and i imagine of um journalism is that talking to people about the past it's like a notoriously slippery subject and particularly around things like honor asking people what it was like previously were things more restrictive or less restrictive people give you widely differing or certainly in my field site gave me wildly differing and often contradictory answers to that question I think that I would not necessarily say that I'd say the fundamental change is not in the level of um, restriction, but it's more where the onus is placed. So I think previously it was more of a kind of social patriarchal norm, particularly in kind of a rural community that women lived in Perda. And, um, you know, that was uh, very much just the, the, the way life was. And I think that the Tabli Jamaat have come in and have begun to reframe those kind of ideas, but under an Islamic um, rhetoric. I mean, one of the fascinating things that I have not had a chance to explore um, because I haven't been able to go back to India through the, ultimately through COVID and then um, tourists, foreigners not being allowed to go in. But I understand from my research assistant that the Tabligi Jamaat presence in the village has now almost totally vanished, which I think is probably as a result of what happened with the Tabligi Jamaat and the start of 
COVID, where they were sort of tied to um, the beginning of COVID in India and large numbers of uh, Jamatis were expelled. And apparently the women's mosque, uh, the women's madrasa meetings um, that I write about and the women's mosque that they were building, all of that has now ceased. Um, so it, it would be fascinating to know what, uh, yeah, is gonna happen going forward. Sorry, Sonia, over back to you. Sorry, I interrupted. Sonia, you need to unmute yourself, sorry. All right, let me take that again. Um, thank you, Lexi and Alpa. Uh, the other question that I was really interested in talking to you about, Lexi, was uh, the impact of Hindu radicalization in India and the effect on Muslim women. You've laid out for us very well um, the impact on the Muslim community as a whole. We've had since 2014, uh, a spate of absolutely horrific public lynchings of Muslim men, uh, including teenagers. I believe that the youngest victim was about 14 years old and virtually none of the culprits uh, have faced punishment. Um, you've talked about the uh, impact in Kashmir, the hardening of, uh, of, of political lines there, the hijab ban in Karnataka, and something that is just as dangerous, if not more, which is the economic boycott of Muslims. And we are seeing this all over the country with Hindu communities calling for a ban on, you know, anything that is sold by Muslims. And, you know, it starts at the very bottom, which is vendors in the bazaars who are now going to be, you know, impoverished and, and therefore homeless. And the Muslim community in India tends to be poorer, tends to be less educated than other um, uh, religious minorities. So the impact on the community as a whole is going to be absolutely devastating. Mm -hmm. um, when the men are targeted in the fashion that we've discussed with lynchings, with arrests for dissent, uh, uh, you know, um, and uh, in, in, in for various uh, other imagined uh, uh, crimes, the women are left behind. And the women are left to essentially raise the family entirely on their own. Now, one of the things that any of us who worked uh, in an Indian village know is that uh, Indian women in, women in rural India do far, far more work than they're ever given credit for. So, you know, we are taught to believe that a woman in, a, in an Indian village stays at home and she cooks and cleans and looks after the children. So she does domestic work. But as Lexi, I mean, as, as Alpa, as Patricia, we all know that women also work in the fields. They also make their own money. You know, they also look after the animals. So they are capable of doing everything. However, if the man in the family is taken away, either murdered or put in prison for dissent, the woman does become the sole bread earner. Um, and, and, and she is made the head of the family in a society in which women are not given the respect that a man is given. So looking at it through that lens, what kind of changes, what kind of impact are you seeing, number one, or on Muslim women uh, under the Modi government? And what kind of long-term changes do you anticipate? Um, that's a great question. So in terms of the impact that I was aware of when I was in the village, um, it's actually something that I've written about in an article um, for a special journal edition that Patricia put together, which was, um, I found it to be a fascinating and totally unexpected uh, development in women's lives, which was because of how toxic the perception has come to be of Muslim men in India, particularly in bureaucratic and government spaces where they are just, you know, totally ignored. You know, um, women in the village, a large number of the women had begun to act as the kind of political and bureaucratic gatekeepers for their community. So it had now become the job of the women to go 
to the government offices to register the family for various you know welfare schemes for id cards to replace documents they would go and um, kind of hang out there and try and forge these informal relationships with um, brokers and middlemen and police officers as ways in which you know forming these useful connections that they might uh, then be able to utilize at some point in the future and this went against absolutely everything um, that I had expected and also about all of the other rhetoric about their lives but I think it was just born out of a matter of necessity which was the recognition that they were far more likely to um, get what a family needed from a government official than their husband was. Um, so there was this kind of tacit sanctioning of this political foray out um, into these kind of public government spaces. Often they would go with um, a sister-in-law or a daughter-in-law, but quite often they were they were by themselves. And that has been a really wonderful thing for them in terms of widening their lives. The frustrating thing is that it hasn't changed the dynamics that I witnessed at home. So although they have this greater autonomy in this specific area of their lives now, it hasn't changed the power dynamics and balances at home. Whether that will be something that shifts as things progress, I don't know. Um, so in terms of their lives, that has been kind of uh, the biggest change that I witnessed as a result of this kind of very uh, public hostility towards Muslim men in, in public spaces. In terms of future impact, th there were already, you so rightly talked about kind of vendors and day laborers and so many of the women's husbands were in these kind of very, um, precarious forms of labor, and they were already struggling to be chosen for work on building sites, for example. They were already beginning to be the last to be picked for the, the jobs um, by contractors who would come to the side of the road. So I think as this, um, as this kind of rhetoric intensifies, it's going to be absolutely catastrophic for women because you're going to have this generation that don't have the means uh, to really work in any other way apart from doing this sewing work, which is um, very popular uh, sort of from what I'm aware of across parts of the Sundarbans, Ingersava as well. Um, this kind of piecemeal embroidery work where women do the embroidering of saris at home and then it's taken by brokers and sold in the cities. And it's so badly paid. It's really exploitative. It's incredibly time consuming. And physically, it, it, it you know, within a number of years, their eyes, they're just they're losing their eyesight, their hands are struggling to because it's this very uh, intricate kind of embroidery work. And that's the only option that a lot of these families already have for earning any kind of income. Uh, so as that climate around Muslim men intensifies and becomes more and more challenging, it's likely that this kind of labor for women is going to become something that they had to devote even more of their energy to, but it's just not sustainable in the long run. So I, I just don't know what will happen. Thank you. Um, if I may, I have a, another question on the back of Sonia's question, um, um, which is, you know, um, it's really interesting what you're saying, right? Because in a way, Muslim men are becoming more and more redundant in the public public sphere, right? And on the other hand, you have Muslim women who are going to the block of it, block office and who are going out and becoming the mediators and performing these roles that perhaps Muslim men might have done in the past. And what is really um, interesting. Uh, you know, what's really great about your work is the kind of various levels of violence that are, you know, that are so incipient in the book. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's, as you said, I mean, it's full of lots of wonderful things, dreams and aspirations and weddings and, you know, celebrations. But at the same time, there is this like, you know, it is such a violent context, so much domestic violence, right? Mm. And what I'm really interested in is, um, uh, you know, there are these uh, theories about violence whereby um, when you, what is the relationship between these different levels of violence? So if Muslim men are becoming more and more redundant in the public sphere, and if there is like, you know, if their role is becoming more and more, redundant i mean you know there's presumably a crisis of masculinity a crisis of you know your role as a householder and often this is reflected in domestic violence right um so i wanted to kind of understand a bit more about how you see the nature of domestic violence having transformed over time as a result of the kind of emasculation that muslim men are facing in in current in, in current India as a result of Hindu majoritarianism, right? So how are these like kind of various levels of violence interlinked? And do you think that um, Muslim women, perhaps the kind of levels of domestic violence are in, in a way increasing or changing in new ways because uh, of the economic question of what's happening mm -hmm. to, to Muslim, Muslim men that Sonia you know, asked you about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of, um, it's kind of an accepted truth that under economic pressure, other kinds of external pressure intensify domestic violence within a home. And I think that's true in the UK. I mean, you saw the rise of domestic violence during COVID um, when families are placed under a huge amount of economic strain and also a strain on space and uh, restrictions on their livelihoods. So it, it would not be surprising if a very similar uh, pattern was occurring in India presently. And I think it's something that someone should do some research on, um, definitely. But I think in my own context, whilst I was there, I witnessed it in one particular family um, where there was um, the husband who had been a, a daily labourer in the city and was finding it harder and harder and harder to get work and he whenever he couldn't work would become would basically get drunk and become incredibly violent towards his wife and that also intensified the relationship with her mother-in-law who had not approved of their marriage it was a love marriage they had met by chance and that's still quite unusual um, in the village and whilst attitudes do seem to superficially be changing. People will talk about love marriage as being something that they they certainly acknowledge it happens and will even say, oh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind love marriage, just not in the case of my family. So it's very much like, it's okay if other people do it, but just as long as it's not my children, because that would be um, appalling. And so she, the mother-in-law was very um, disappointed that he'd married this woman and blamed her and the fact that they had three very small children as kind of a drag on him and a drag on his economic aspirations. So it had hugely intensified her situation of domestic violence. And I would imagine that situations like hers are being replicated across the country where there is this kind of public stripping of masculinity and autonomy and sense of self as being tied to work and um, success. And that has presumably very sadly got to have really serious um, knock-on consequences for women, Muslim women at home at the moment. Sonia, would you like to say anything more at this point? Or should I hand over to Tricia? Yes, go ahead, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, Tricia, over to you. Okay, thanks very much. I, I really am glad, Lexi, that you were brave enough to write Beyond Academia, because this is a, a wonderful, wonderful book, and the stories are so carefully interwoven and thematically arranged to capture the sort of different aspects of everyday life. And I, I really love the evocative portrayals of the village environs, the social atmosphere and these specific 
women who uh, you focused on. Um, and at the same time, these very delicate, as Sonia was suggesting, so these sort of delicate references to things going on beyond the village, the elections, the tabligi jamaat, um, which are sometimes in the village, obviously, but also to far distant communal politics and violence, all the issues about debt and vulnerability, and tensions and cooperation amongst women and, and all these sort of things, which are all very familiar themes in more um, obviously academic style literature, which you've portrayed in such a lovely poetic fashion. Um, I think I'm going to be taking the discussion off in a slightly different direction rather than focusing on what um, what is happening or was happening in the village when you were working there um, and thinking about more about more about how to write about all of this stuff. Um, in the author's note, Lexi throws down a little gauntlet which goes to the effect of I've never understood why ethnography must be an argument as opposed to just being. And that set me thinking, uh, because over the years I've obviously mulled over similar sorts of concerns and questions about how to write about the ordinary everyday lives of villagers in, in India. And I think the very fact that I've done so in different ways over the years indicates that I have actually no idea how to go about it and I'm not very sure that I've come to any firm conclusions at all. So I'd like my comments really to be seen in that sort of very uncertain questioning light. But um, for today, my, my starting point would be in relation to things that we've already addressed in some ways, the Islamophobic accounts of Muslims in India often focusing on, on Muslim women, all the fake information that there is about women, Muslim women, very long standing views. Right? You can go back to sort of 19th century, early 20th century historians with some of the absolute rubbish they were writing about medieval. India and the effects of these Muslim invasions and so on. And of course, in most recent decades, um, coming to be much more virulent and verbally as well as physically violent. So briefly, we're, we're writing in a context in which there are a lot of people out there with some very nasty, troubling, pernicious agendas. And my question, I suppose, is, is how should we how can we, as, as researchers working with and amongst Muslim women in India, uh, respond? Whatever we write, there is some sort of authorial task going on because we don't publish undigested field notes. So at some level, we, we all end up having some sort of a, a agenda, even if we don't necessarily state it that clearly up front. But I think the question is uh, very important to ask, what sort of agenda should we have? How do we, at one level, how do we write in a fashion that does justice to the people we're, we're writing about? How do we write in a way that um, makes their lives comprehensible to people who haven't been there? Uh, and how do we weigh up what to include and what to exclude? Are we going to be driven by academic debates? And to what extent might political debates and political events also have a bearing on our decisions about how we write? Um, Alpa mentioned one of my books, Don't Marry Me to a Plowman, which I began writing in the early 1990s. Um, and although in part it relates to some of the academic concerns of that time about everyday lives, about focusing on the particular, the specific, the uh, micro level um, and conveying that by use of a sort of biographical style. It was also very clear that the ongoing fallout from the Charbonneau affair, which kicked off in the 1980s, uh, was still very prominent in political debates in, in India. And so beyond the sort of more academically related concerns when I was writing, I had an agenda, if all, albeit somewhat muted agenda, of thinking about um, Muslim women in relation to the Charbonneau discussions. So I'd most definitely had an agenda uh, to question Muslim women's exceptionalism, to foreground the sort of commonalities between Muslim women and Hindu women, to suggest that in many respects, 
gender politics, or if you like, being a woman, trumped communal politics and being a Muslim, that the, the women I was writing about should be seen primarily as North Indian women. And in terms of domestic politics, I think there's, um, that is something that still probably is very largely, largely the case. But if we fast forward now to the early two, 2020s, We've got an even more poisonous communal atmosphere. We've got vigilantes on the on the loose in certainly in places like UP, um, where I'm work, where I work. We've got politicians, not to mention any names, but you know who I mean, who persist in their anti-hate Muslim hate speech. There's all the spreading of the fake news about Quran, Corona jihad, stereotypes of Muslims as anti-nationals and terrorists the falsehoods of population jihad and saffron demography and so on and so forth. So I'm writing in this very, very unsavory conjuncture and trying to encompass almost four decades of research in a Muslim village in UP, but do so at the same time in an academic way. So my, my primary academic endeavor is to portray uh, demographic changes that have taken place, very significant demographic changes that have taken place in the village over that period, alongside the massive economic changes during that period, and also alongside the state's increasing surveillance and intrusion into family life, perhaps most notably in, in relation to demographic issues in uh, the realm of reproductive and child health. Now, I would like to say that in most respects, the characters I'm writing about are quote unquote, ordinary North Indian villagers who happen to be Muslims, in as much as they are people who want their children to thrive, want their sons to find employment in a time of jobless growth, want their daughters to get married in a time of uh, dowry escalation. And when they get old, they want to rest assured that they will receive care in old age. And in that sort of respect, um, these are all challenges that are faced by Hindu and Dalit villagers in nearby villages. <coughs> and in most respects, the people in the village I've, where I've worked get on with their daily lives, much like the Hindu and Muslim neighbors. Um, and there are certain interactions across, across these, these sort of barriers as well. So a story that emphasized Muslim exceptionalism would fail to capture that because what I'm wanting to try and get at is just how very much like any, any North Indian villagers they are. But of course, unlike their Hindu and Dalit uh, neighbors, they have to contend with an added very poisonous ingredient. That is, there are, there are important parts of their lives that do arise from their being Muslim. Rather little I would emphasize to do with Islamic doctrine, despite the commentaries that you get from Hindutva circles, uh, but rather a lot to do with the very, very toxic intrusions of communal, communalized politics that continually emphasize their Muslimness. Uh, just to take a couple of examples, for instance, um, the, the villagers and I think Muslims more widely do have a very long standing fear of the family planning program, which itself is a heritage of the sterilization drive in the in the emergency. And this certainly colors how health staff deal with Muslim women. It also, I might say, um, uh, affects how Muslim families think about the family planning program. Um, there are also uh, wider systemic biases, which have already been alluded to, th things like the siting of schools, things like the structured biases in how jobs are allocated. I don't mean necessarily an overt direct discrimination, but uh, I think virtually throughout India, people talk about um, bribery or influence in UP, you'd be talking about Rishwat and Sifarish as the ways you get into jobs. And if you're a Muslim, you're not well placed to exercise either of those means of getting into employment. So that in itself has an impact on the sorts of livelihood options that, that the men have, in addition to all the things that we uh, have already been mentioned, mentioned today. 
And then, of course, there's the whole business of the Citizen Amendment Act, uh, which highlights how unwelcome they are in today's India. I was, I was doing fieldwork last um, in early 2020 when this was all going on, and I had many conversations with people along the lines of, "But you know, how can we possibly go to Pakistan? We don't know anybody. We haven't got any land there. This is where we've lived for centuries, uh, and so on." So. Uh, Although I think in places like Bengal and Assam, <coughs> which are nearer the borders, um, people have every reason to be very frightened, even in Western UP, which is about as far away from uh, the Pakistan or the Bangladesh border as you could get, people are absolutely petrified. Now, writing about these elements of Muslim exceptionalism alongside portrayals of ordinary people who happen to be Muslims is, as you can, I'm sure you can imagine, really quite a complicated task. And it basically means that my writing certainly isn't just being, um, to, go, to go in Lexi's phrase. Because um, at one level, I certainly am aiming to, to challenge the common sense falsehoods that have acquired such widespread currency and that are often used as the battle cries of Hindutva rabble rousers. Now, can I do this? Can I manage to do this? And if I do, is there any hope of doing more than preaching to the converted? I, I rather fear not. And I'm wondering, uh, to throw out a point that we can perhaps get Lexi to think about, I'm wondering if Lexi's decision about how to write nine paths has actually more prospect of opening people's minds to the everyday realities of Muslim life in India than my plonky academic attempt to tackle these issues. Um, <laughs> I, that is a lot for me to think about. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is, I think that whenever you're writing anything, you're making an authorial choice, right? I mean, I think, um, I also say somewhere in the author's note, you know, obviously these are stories that I've, this is thing, these are things that I've witnessed. They're not impartial. It's not a kind of perfectly um, objective standpoint. And there will always be the impact of the person who is writing the book. And I think part of my choice to write this book in the way that I did um, is partly uh, because, um, it's what I like to read. Um, and I, I love reading narrative nonfiction um, because for me, it's what really brings things alive. And um, I believe that you can explore these kind of macro uh, questions, albeit not as thoroughly in the way that you're talking about through people's lives. But uh, it's also because it lends itself to my particular kind of writing. And I think, you know, there is a decision that we all make as, as writers to write in a way that hopefully reflects where our strengths are. Um, but I think what you're talking about, the complexity of trying to frame these narratives, and I think I was being slightly facetious saying, you know, I, I wonder why ethnography can't just be because obviously, you know, as when we go and undertake this kind of really in depth and very densely situated research, we're, we're coming from a place of such um, complicated and complex uh, knowledge and concerns and history and politics. And, you know, we are doing the research itself with all of this kind of stuff embedded you know we are embedded in this stuff as we undertake the research so I think that it forms a part of what you end up exploring anyway because your very questions and your observations are going to be informed and motivated by the things that you are kind of conscious of um, but I do you know I do wonder um, and I guess this is something that we was um, that we, I think all agreed that we would like to talk about in this session, which is about what the ability is going to be going forward to do this kind of 
writing and to write in these ways about women's lives and whether that is going to be something that is going to become more challenging uh, in the current political climate and whether these stories will be able to be kind of uh, given the attention and um, focus that they deserve given what is happening politically and I don't know if anyone else has got thoughts on that. Thanks, Lexi. Um, yeah, I'm really interested to know Sonia's thoughts on your on your question of, you know, how do we keep capturing the lives of, um, yeah, difficult uh, lives of people who are being persecuted, uh, to put it bluntly, in, in India, in the kind of way that you you, you know you do um, through this very in depth. Um, methods that are so intimate um Sonia your book you know like shaped over four years going back and forth to the villages really like a project which you thought would take a short while in, in the end you know took you so long and um to what extent you know how would you see the future of 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 these um yeah of being able to capture the lives of ordinary Muslim women uh for example um I, I had a question on the back of Trisha's to ask you about as well, but maybe I will save that for, for if there's time for further discussion. Um, uh, but yeah, um, Sonia, Trisha, any thoughts on Lexi's question? Well, you know, um, so the reporting for the Good Girls, as you said, took about four years. Um, I blame myself for the length of time. I'm just slow at, at, at my work. But um, for that, I, I, you know, I would, I would do a lot of traveling on by road to get to the village and then to get to other districts in Uttar Pradesh. And Uttar Pradesh is, of course, just enormous. It's been compared size-wise to Brazil. And uh, a lot of the work uh, involved interviewing politicians, police officers, you know, a, a wide range of people at different levels of power or, or, or even, and of course, powerlessness. I was never, um, I never felt under any threat. Um, I felt as I had while reporting my earlier book, which was a beautiful thing, which was set in the dance bars of Bombay. And for that, you know, again, I traveled a lot. Um, there, there was a lot of work in brothels, a lot of work in, in some of the, you know, the, the lesser known perhaps seedier suburbs of, of, of the city. And even then um, I was, I always felt safe. And I had that same feeling in Uttar Pradesh. Um, but there was one thing that happened, Alpa, which has never happened to me. And I've been a journalist since I was in university. And this happened towards the end of my reporting. I was talking to a police officer and it was a casual conversation walking by uh, the, the river. And suddenly he turned to me and he said, and what is your religion? And you know, um, that is the one, of the most unsettling things that I have ever been asked in my entire career as a journalist, because uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, as journalists and as writers, you know, our anonymity is very important to us. It is perhaps a selfish position to take, but it is important because it allows us not to become the center of the story. It allows you know, us to make the subjects the center of the story. But the other reason it really, um, hit me with great force was because that was the time when things were changing very rapidly and people were beginning to understand that the thoughts that they had could now be voiced openly and that they could now use the answers they got to those questions uh, in their decision to of, of how to treat people mm. uh, in of how to place them um, and you know, as again, as a journalist and writer, you're usually outside of those systems, right? You're you're an observer. Um, it doesn't matter what your religion is, or it shouldn't, or your caste. These things do not uh, are not supposed to interfere in that relationship that you develop with your subject. But the fact that I was asked that question really unnerved me, um, and I just and I and I, I told him, and you could see that he was startled. Um, it was unusual for him. Uh, you know, I'm Roman Catholic. What, where do, does he place me? How does he treat me? Um, how would he treat me now, four or five years later? Um, because there was an edge 
to that question. So what I realized on that last trip was that things were changing, mm -hmm. uh, even for somebody like me who's you know very careful about being anonymous. I, you know, when I report now, uh, I expect that I will be harassed, that I will be told that I am working for the, a party, a political party, that I'm, you know, a, a paid journalist, so to speak, a very favorite mm -hmm. term of the, you know, the uh, radicalized Hindus to suggest that journalists are not objective. So I expect for everything that I write, uh, an, an enormous amount of harassment. And it's become the new normal, which it shouldn't. You know, it's just, I just assume that this is going to happen to me. And I do think that there is an enormous amount of pressure on journalists working in India today. Um, but, you know, the fact is that the journalism and the writing continues. Mm. And the young journalists, young Muslim journalists in India, men and women in different parts of the country are doing extraordinary work. And while I salute them, I just feel so terrible that in India today, you know, journalism is not about writing and reporting. It is about survival. And you put everything on the line when you report uh, about issues that the government prefers that you keep silent, whether it is poverty, whether it is hunger, whether it is religious polarization, you know, the subjects that you can report on have become narrower and narrower until at this point, you can only report on, on, on the government's speaking points um, if you want not to be harassed, not to be trolled. So I, 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 I think the work continues, um, but I think the hazards that Indian journalists face or is, is, is substantial. And we really must pay close attention to it um, and, and support Indian journalists and journalists in India uh, as much as we can. Because of course, you know, people like you, me, uh, Patricia, Lexi, whatever work we do, we don't live in India. You know, we go in, we go out. So we have, we have our protections. The real concern is those who live in India um, and are, are essentially performing great acts of courage, which they shouldn't have to. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Sonia, for that. You know, couldn't agree more, right? Trisha, you had you had something to you wanted to add to that, yes? Yes, just just to follow up on that. I mean, absolutely right, Sonia. I mean, I have the luxury of sitting at my desk in Edinburgh, anguishing about how I'm writing this stuff. But I think, um, you know, as a visible, visibly obvious foreigner, going back and doing research is becoming increasingly difficult and I would like to think I could go back uh, but I think most of us know about Filippo Asella who was recently deported from from India um, so you know there are ways in which foreign researchers have problems um, continuing doing doing the research that they, they want to do um, I suppose going back a few steps as well I, I wanted to respond to something something else um, and that is to ask perhaps a rather more direct question than I asked earlier on is what is our what is our writing aiming to do? I mean, are we trying to do a bit more than kind of describe the real world out there? Or are we trying to um, torpedo all the fake news that's coming out of Hindutva mouths or, or, or what? And, and is the latter even possible? Oh, I mean, we, you know, is it a dialogue of the deaf? Or are we just banging bang our head against the brick wall trying to do that? I think for me, it's, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, I think, no. the, you know, just the way that I've always seen my work, um, even in my earlier books and, and long before, um, uh, you know, India was so heavily radicalized is that uh, it is, uh, it, it's, it's, what I do is, is a chronicle of our times. You know, mm -hmm. it is simply creating, um, it, it's simply capturing a time of, it, it, in our lives um, and capturing it accurately. Because one of the things that we know that governments like this do is they try and erase our history. They, and as they, they try and prevent us from uh, questioning our present. And, 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 and they try and make us, convince us that what we are seeing, that what we are hearing is incorrect. 
that the truth is only what they tell us. So whatever our role, whether as anthropologists or journalists, as writers, I think our role is to tell the truth. And in telling the truth itself, I think we are doing our duty, which is to preserve uh, an account of things as they actually happened. Because you know, misinformation and disinformation is actually distorting the present for many millions of people, and certainly not just in India. You know, there are people who you cannot have a conversation with anymore because their idea of information, their idea of facts is something that they saw on YouTube or received as a WhatsApp forward. So I, my burden is the same as it's always been, which is to tell the truth and see it as I write it. Mm. Thanks, Sonia. Yeah, and, and obviously there's so many questions which have been so present in my mind as well with the writing of Night March. But I'm really interested in Lexi's um, response to you, um, Tricia, because, you know, as you said, Lexi, things changed right from the time when you first did your fieldwork. I mean, what happened in the country really transformed and the persecution of Muslims became so much more intense. And I, I did wonder when, you know, in, in terms of the writing of the book, whether this was something that you really wanted to tackle head on or whether, you know, um, it was a year in the life of an Indian village as the title, you know, puts it. Um, because it, it's kind of, it's so subtle, right? It's kind of, it's, it's, it's you really, I mean, to a, a person who doesn't know the Indian context, it wouldn't be obvious what the significance of these stories are. Um, that in, in the context of, you know, as, as, as Sonia says, a chronicle of our time, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's like, um, it, it's, also because your author's voice is you know not there in, in you know you're not there in in the text um uh i mean sonia's not there in her texts either in, in, but you know she's there at the she tells you at the end how she gets there but it's so obvious like the wider political context that she's aiming to capture through these stories and and i guess with with you i did one i wondered whether you know this extreme you know, where you're writing about the most persecuted people in, in in the world you know like muslim women within the muslim uh muslims being the most persecuted community in india and 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 and, and then within that muslim women and i wondered whether that was like whether when you were writing you were conscious that you know of of, of that you were trying to tackle these wider narratives and myths or whether because things changed so much over the course of the period you know things things became much worse mm -hmm. um whether it's like now that you're also reflecting back on what it means to have written this book so i was just like wondering yeah uh what in terms of your you know as as patricia says you know is it just about being or is it about something something more that you're actually doing in this book um so i think that i sort of much like all anthropologists and probably to an extent journalists although we work slightly differently you have that time lag between when you're conducting your research and when you're writing. So I was conscious that by the time that I started writing this as in its current form, you know, having written it as a thesis uh, previously that the climate had changed, you know, because it was four years later, things were much, uh, much worse. And I did have questions about, uh, you know, was what I was writing still reflective of what their lives would have been like? And I guess that ties into something that Sonia said that I just think is really beautiful and is really what my authorial intention was, which is a chronicle of our times. And it was something that I was met constantly with in the run up to conducting fieldwork with people who had preconceptions about the Muslim community in India, had preconceptions particularly about Muslim women, were very happy to voice those very troubling assumptions to me, but had never met a Muslim woman in India, had never spent time in a rural Muslim community. And so actually just providing a window into what their world was like, aside from all of the things going on, you know, in the wider country, which do kind of feed in in a subtle way, um, was definitely what I 
set out to do. But I think also being really honest is, you know, they don't have that much of their time to be concerned about these things. It's just the daily business of living is what is, you know, exhausting and troubling and frustrating. And they were concerned about what was going on and particularly around, um, because of the time that I was there around eating beef and they were very concerned about that because it was something that is very, um, intertwined for them with religious significance and moments of celebration and that was suddenly becoming problematized um but in general you know there were still floors to sweep and marriages to organize and you know difficult financial situations to, to navigate and I wanted to reflect what their most pressing concerns were which were what what I ended up writing about whether that would be different now I don't know I think it probably would be I think it would potentially these things have intensified in such a way in the last five six years that I think it could potentially be a different story thanks so much Lexi I'm gonna take a few oh. Trisha maybe we can come back or if you've got something very quick because I do want to take a few questions yeah it was just an immediate response to to what Lexi was saying I mean I when I first started working on this book and was doing sort of additional bits of field work, I went back and did field work in 2018, 19 and 20. And I would, I think the tone I felt I was going to be writing in when I came back in 2018 was really quite upbeat in a way. Um, and as time went on, the economic downturn began to hit. And then more and more the citizens, the CAA and, and then subsequently um, COVID and so on. Um, I feel I've got to write, the tone has got to be a lot, um, not utterly pessimistic, but it's got to be colored by some rather more obviously negative aspects of their everyday struggles to, to live. I mean, they were worried enough in 2018 about, or they were worried enough in my earlier field work in, in, in the 2000s, about how do you get your boys into jobs? They were still worried about that. But the times have changed even since, uh, since the, the 2000s, the 2010s have seen all sorts of pro problems with young men getting into jobs and so forth, which, which weren't there 15 years ago, 25 years ago. So I can see the, 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 the specific context changes and and it uh, it is a real problem because there will be a time lag between my doing that field work and actually getting this stuff out into the public sphere and the, the situation will probably have changed all all over again thanks trisha i'm just going to take a couple of questions from the the audience uh ronit uh, anand asks a question which is kind of related to what we've been talking about um he says, can we um, view the increase of the patriarchal stranglehold on these women as a reaction to the inequality, the growth of neoliberalism? Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll pose to you a couple of other questions too, and then you can maybe decide what you want to, want to, want to address. Um, Shraddha Jain has a couple of questions around the role of migration. What role did it play, you know, if, if any? And she also has a question about how Muslim women, you know, um, interacted with other women through various stages of life. I mean, that's a very broad question, but you could um, you could address it in the in the way in which you choose. Yeah. Um, so starting with how they interacted with other women. I mean, uh, the village that I worked in did used to be a mixed Hindu and Muslim village. And that had changed over the last sort of two or three decades. There had been Hindu families living in the village, but they had moved um, towards the, the town and, and also other Hindu villages on the island. Um, typically because they were economically able to do so and it was more convenient to live near the town where they had access to schools and um, temples, uh, but also because they um, felt less comfortable around living close to Muslim communities, keeping animals and eating meat and having butchers stands in the village. Um, so their kind of interaction with other um, 
other women, even just outside of their village, is pretty limited because their days are so tightly constrained around the household. And that, I mean, that's one of the reasons that it makes it, uh, it, it made it easy in a way to do field work because women were typically always at home working. Um, so you could, you know, they're very, they don't travel out of the village to socialize. Um, they don't uh, go and see friends or neighbors. They even very rarely visit their families because of the burden of their lives, uh, their family lives and upkeep in the village. So really the only interactions they would be having with other women might be at things like microfinance group meetings, but even then it's typically from within their communities. So it is, it is a feeling of being quite isolated, which I think goes back to something that Sonia raised at the very beginning, which is this thing of honor and gossip and you know the closeness of these communities where everyone knows everyone and the lives are very intertwined. Um, in terms of migration, there wasn't a huge amount of labor migration um, from the village that I worked in. Some of the younger men uh, did work in Kolkata and they would um, return on a sort of weekly or bi-weekly basis, but it wasn't that phenomena that you know, I'm aware of that you see in other parts of India where, you know, a third or a half of all the men in the village are, have gone migrating for labor. Um, that just wasn't the case here. Uh, so yeah, that's that's all I can really say on migration. And in terms of the impact of um, neoliberalism and inequality as kind of increasing this patriarchal stranglehold on women, um, I guess I'm always reluctant to draw um, connections, sort of simple connections between things. Um, because there's so many other things going on. But I do think that, as we've kind of discussed, the fact that uh, Muslim men are being denied, um, are being so kind of uh, vilified in public spaces and are being denied access to work and denied access to um, the public sphere, I do think that has intensified um, levels of violence and probably will continue to do so. Thanks, Lexi. Um, we do have um, a, a couple of questions from um, Omawumni Ologbeni. Um, and I guess the question is around the thriving of uh, single women in, in, in this context. Um, yeah, of course, these uh, societies are, are not matrilinear. Um, uh, so yeah, um, maybe, I mean, you have several characters who are, maybe you could draw on one of your characters to, to, to address um, Omomuni's question. Um, so there is a woman who I didn't, uh, who I don't think I refer to even at all in the book um, because I didn't get the chance to know her as well as I would have liked, but she was quite extraordinary in terms of being a single woman, what she had achieved. Um, she had basically become, she had, her husband had taken a second wife and so she had left him because she had said, I'm not prepared to, have to be part of um, a polygamous household. So she had gone back to live with her parents, which is typically what would happen. And in most cases, she would then become a burden on her parents to, who, who were aging or her brother who would have to look after her. But she decided to become a sari broker. So instead of doing the embroidery work, she wanted to actually be the middle person. Um, and she was quite phenomenal. She worked out that if she bought all of the products for the saris on the island, as opposed to in Kolkata, it would be cheaper. So she could have a better profit margin so she could pay the women more. Um, and so she had recruited this large number of women in the village to work for her because she paid them almost double what the men did. And she was much more flexible with the hours um, and the kind of the quality of the work she produced was um, was superior. And that to me was pretty phenomenal. Um, and she was definitely an exception, um, but also an indicator of exactly what 
women can do in those situations, provided that they have the right set of circumstances. So she had the support of her family, she had the support of her parents and the support of her brother um, and her daughter. And she had kind of established herself in this very economically powerful way, which, yeah, is perhaps an insight into what could happen um, in these kind of situations if the circumstances are right. <laughs> For sure. Just as a follow up question to that, Lexi, out of curiosity, weren't the, the men who had been in that sort of niche before pretty angry? Didn't they try and obstruct her activities? I mean, when I asked her about uh, that, she um, was very... Uh, I don't want to say cagey, but I, th I think, you know, there, there was enough of a of a number of women doing this kind of work in the village that it didn't have too much of an impact on their specific businesses. Um, it was quite a tribal thing, which broker you worked with. It was typically to do with family connections. So inevitably where you end, who you ended up working with for was kind of assigned by who your family was and who their connections were and what political party they voted for and all those kind of things so it didn't pose too much of a problem to her I don't think but yeah she wasn't that forthcoming thanks since there's time for um perhaps uh, one or two more interventions um I, I wanted to ask you something um Lexi about something I found absolutely brilliant and fascinating throughout your book is so you've got these nine women that you focus on um but there, there's also these other beings who are very very present in your book right these um genies uh who are you know who are everywhere um who are these kind of spiritual beings who can be very dangerous uh, sometimes good um and um I, you know, of course, you know, having worked in other parts of rural India um, in, amongst Adivasis too, there are so many different types of spirits that are always omnipresent and have this very complicated relationships with people. And one thing I was trying to understand, but I wasn't sure about is um, how, um, how, the, how the relationship with the genies might be changing or not in this um, transforming context of, you know, um, yeah, the rise of Hindu majoritarianism and, and Muslims being persecuted more so than ever. And, um, you know, we've talked about intra-household violence and, and its relationship to um, wider structural forces. And I, I was wondering about these genies. Um, what do you think is happening with these genies? Um, uh, are they always around in the same way as they were before? Or are they playing some other role um, uh, uh, with time, yeah, given the wider changes? Um, I mean, again, pertaining to something that I said earlier, I think one of the challenges that I had around asking about the Ginny and, and what the relationship was, is that people had a view of what it was like in the past that certainly seemed quite rose tinted. So the, the, the rhetoric was that the Ginny had previously, they'd been very close with the villagers and this relationship was more kind of like the mutual exchange of gifts and they would leave presents for them and, um, you know, uh, sort of like offerings of food or gold. Um, and that it was only latterly that in more recent years that things had started to sour in terms of those relationships. Um, and I mean, I was at great pains to not put forward a theory about what was happening with the Ginny, mainly because I I wanted to kind of respect the, the understanding the women had of them as these things that were there. And I didn't feel like I could really capture um, what was going on uh, with them without somehow kind of implying or suggesting something pejorative. But it was very noticeable that they, see, they were seeming to um, afflict 
women more more often than men and it was often at moments of kind of rupture and change so puberty uh marriage coming into a new household becoming a new mother um these were the moments where the jinnies were choosing to catch the women um and possess them uh so there definitely seems to be a connection between these moments of kind of uh intense emotion and pressure and change in their lives um and the occurrence of the jinni um and there was also a, a narrative around you know the kinds of people that got possessed and um one woman in particular kalima was sort of prided herself on that she was not the kind of woman that would ever get possessed and she would you know stand in the path and shout at them and kind of hold her ground and there was also kind of a narrative around strength i think and um mental and psychological strength um for who was afflicted and who was not thanks thanks so much and we are at 2:30 and i just before we close the um, event, I want to thank Sonia Falero and Patricia Jeffrey enormously for joining us uh, for this event, for their thoughts, reflections, um, comparative commentary, and yeah, raising, you know, very thought provoking questions. And above all, Lexi, thanks to you and congratulations on this really very, very beautiful um, book and excellent read. Please, um, everybody, um, do go away and um, buy Lexi's book and um, immerse yourself uh, into the Sundarbans and into the lives of these Muslim women in India. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to the team at the LSE Events Inequalities Institute and Anthropology um, for hosting us. All the best.